Um, here's what I'll say about Unit 7. Um, it depends on the day, Stephanie. Um, what I'll say about Unit 7 is that this is probably the unit where people could improve their test scores the most with the least amount of work of all the units we do in the class. Now, I, this unit is not nearly as important as like unit three or unit six as far as testing goes, but there are a healthy dose of questions from unit seven, and most of them are vocabulary. Most of them don't require thinking from this unit. This is very much a vocabulary unit. Would you kind of agree with that, Seth? Like the way it's tested, that the, this is mostly vocabulary? Yeah. Whenever we see people who are coming to us and they're like, oh my God, I can't pass the test, whether it be a certain portion, and I look at it, I'm like, okay, they're doing really good on agency. They're doing really good on financing. And then we get the evaluation. And I'm like, oh. And, and, and it's easy to fix because right. it is vocabulary based. It is. I would say. But, sorry, Travis, but beyond what you were just saying, like agency financing, those ones, I would say this is tier number two. It is tier number two. And those and the thing about agency and finance, especially agency, is such a complex topic that it takes a long time to get it fixed. You have to fix it because there's so many questions. The good thing about this one is it's kind of a medium level tested topic, but an easy to fix topic. Um, right. And I think that's kind of what you're looking for when you're strategically trying to study and help yourself the most without spending hours and hours and hours. So I think this is a really good unit to really go back through several times and make sure you have the vocabulary nailed down. This unit deals with the process of predicting what we think the value of a property is. Why do I say predicting? Nobody needs to know what the value of a property is when it's already sold. You don't, you don't walk up to somebody and go, what do you think your house is worth a day after they bought it? Right. Because what would, be, what would their price. answer be? The price. The sales price. The sales price from yesterday. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. But as time goes on, the value of things changes. Right. And that is certainly true of real estate. And one of the biggest pieces of advice that our clients rely on us for with the skill part of old car, that R, that reasonable skill, one of the reasonable skills that our clients can expect from us is advice about the value of the real estate that they either own and they're trying to sell or that they are looking at making an offer on. If we're a buyer's agent, is it just as important to be able to give a prediction of value as if we're a seller's agent? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They, I mean, otherwise, how how does the buyer know that they're offering a fair number? Let me tell you one of the classic sort of mistakes I think new real estate licensees make. You, they shop based on list price. That's a horrible way to help right. your clients decide on an offer, folks. How do you know if that listing agent was knowledgeable? How do you know number? how you know how they come up with that number? Seller. You you don't know where that number came from. You can't say, "Oh, I think we should offer above list price" or "I think we should offer below list price" without having some basis for that advice. Does right. that make sense for everybody? Like, and Travis, just to go in on what you're saying, like you can't just say, oh, I think we should go above without making sure that that house is priced reasonably for that market. In the first place. Are they in the good ballpark? Right. It could be overpriced. It could be underpriced. And giving bad advice, folks, can really cost your clients. I'll give you an example of how giving bad advice could cost you with a buyer client. What if the house, the property is already underpriced? Maybe the seller and their agent underpriced it. That happens. It's not common, but it does happen from time to time. Like they just missed the boat and clearly they didn't know what they had on their hands and they've listed it for fifty or $75,000 less than everything else is selling for in the neighborhood. That sounds like it'd be great for your buyer client, does it not? Mm -hmm. Here's where you could ruin it. Well, I always advise my buyers to offer a little bit less than list price, and then we can just see what the seller comes back with. Meanwhile, the seller just got 15 other offers that are all forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars above list price. Are you even going to get a response to your buyer's offer? What do you think? 
No. No, no. you're not going to get a response. You're not going to get a response. And so you actually cost your buyer the price to buy that, that property, property simply because you gave bad advice about pricing. So value yeah. is such an important topic for us. It is. But that being said, it's a guess. It is a guess. Travis, what you said when we first started this section, I want everybody to hear this loud and clear because I was a victim of this mindset before coming into a real estate class. I would always be like, oh, well, that's just the list price of the property. But that is all guesses. Mm -hmm. Everybody's guess. And that's why it's up to us to make sure when we are representing somebody's best interest and we're saying, okay, like my client's getting ready to make an offer on this house. I need to make sure that this house is reasonably priced because they're going to go get a loan. And if that loan doesn't appraise, yada, 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 like the whole thing falls apart. It falls apart. Absolutely. Jessica, you had your hand up. Yeah. So would you say, I guess when using that scenario, would you say like, oh, give an actual monetary value of like, oh, you should offer X amount of money. Or would you say, hey, this is kind of what it's worth. Kind of. Here's, you, here's you know, what you would say. We don't use words like worth. Here's what you say. In my opinion, okay. I believe this property is underpriced. In my opinion, I believe this property is overpriced. In my opinion, I think this property is ultimately going to sell for this price because it's important to understand that anytime someone is giving a statement of value, they are simply giving their what, folks? And this is going to be tested. Yes. The best guess. guess. It's a guess. It's an opinion. Even the professionals. Who are the professionals that give opinions of value? Appraisers. Appraisers. Even an appraiser's opinion of value is still just an opinion. Here's what they're going to suck you into on test. An appraisal is an exact statement of the property's value. Is that true? No. 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 An appraisal is an opinion of the property's value that just happens to come from a licensed appraiser. Right. And it just also so happens to be a very specific number. But That's that it. doesn't mean it's the value of it. It doesn't number. mean it's the value. It's still their opinion. I, I, here's the analogy I like to use for that. Because we all got this person in our family. Everybody's got one person in their family thinks they, know, they can diagnose you better than any physician on earth. Like, because they got WebMD, they know they can, you know, you can get a medical opinion from this person. Whether you want it or not, you're going to get one. I <laughs> don't know who I'm talking about, right? In your life, you got that person. Oh, yes. Or then you could also go to the doctor and get a medical opinion. Just because you got it from a doctor doesn't mean it's exact. It's still a what? An opinion. an opinion. It's still an opinion. It's just an opinion from somebody who is trained to give that opinion versus an opinion from somebody who is just shooting from the hip, so to speak. And we can some trained doctors who are really bad. That's it. And there are trained appraisers who are really bad, you know? And so the only difference between an appraisal and an opinion of value that just comes from Joe Q public walking down the street is the license that the appraiser has. They are licensed to um, provide that opinion to the public and charge for it. Just like with us, what do we need a real estate license for? Help people with real estate transactions other than ourselves and get what? Paid. Paid for it. You don't need an appraiser's license in North Carolina to give people an opinion of what a property is worth. You need an appraiser's license to give people an opinion of what a property is worth and get what? Paid compensated. And get compensated or paid for that opinion. So it's still going to be an opinion. Don't don't get drawn into those answers with, oh, this is the definite value of the property. This is the absolute value of the property. What's the most common reason an appraisal is done? Now, there are lots of reasons they could be done. There are lots of time, uh, situations where they could be ordered. Basically, anybody can order appraisal. A homeowner can order an appraisal at any time if they're just curious about knowing what the property is worth. They could order an appraisal if they're trying to prove they have 20% equity to get rid of their PMI. What do you think is the most common reason for an appraisal, though? To get a loan for the lender. Yeah. To get a loan. That's exactly right. To get a loan. And well, what's the most Brian's comment? To what get was an that? Idea of what it's worth? Yeah, to get an idea of what it's worth is absolutely true. An idea is a really that's a and great place. for the specific reason of obtaining a loan. That is the number one reason that we see appraisals done. 
we want that opinion of value as the basis for this loan because remember lenders need something to base their loan amount on right so they they crave this professional opinion from an appraiser appraisals by their very nature and opinions of value are all going to be based on the past right but they are trying to predict what the present the present or future right the immediate future or present depending on how you look at it. but they're using data from when past. the past now obviously the more recent past the better at predicting the immediate future when you look at an appraisal or any opinion of value do property values change from day to day yes yes of yeah. course yeah for sure so if you were asked on a test how long an appraisal is valid for how long is that opinion of value valid what would you what do you think your an appropriate answer would be for that the day. Day. that day that day that's it because new data comes in every day and that could change our opinion you know, th I want you to think about it this way. Suppose you're basing your opinion of value on the last four or th five sales in the neighborhood and you give them an opinion of value and an hour after you give that opinion of value, a foreclosure in the neighborhood sells for $100,000 less. Does that change your opinion of the value of that property? Just did. Yeah. yeah. So it's now a different number, right? So when we say that they're only good for the data they're conducted, that's simply because the data changes every day. Now, again, we get into terminology here. When coming up with an opinion of value, sometimes you'll see the phrase market value used, and sometimes you'll see market price used. Market price is a real number. Market price is what a property sold for. That home sold for $425,000 two weeks ago. That's a market price. Who decided on that sales price, folks? The seller. The buyer and the seller. The buyer, the buyer and the seller together through a negotiation, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So here's what we know based on that number. We know that that was a number that at least one buyer and seller could agree on for that property. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. Yes. So a market price requires an agreement because it's a, it's a closed number. A market value is not an exact number because it has not occurred yet. A market value is a prediction of what we think the property will sell for. <clears throat> we use the market price of properties that have already closed in order to come up with the market what right. value. value of properties that are currently on the market right we and we'll say that again we use the market price of the ones that have already closed to come up with a number for market value for the ones that haven't yet closed that is the process of appraising or the process of coming up with an opinion of value the other thing to remember, and this is huge when it comes to value and talking to sellers especially, value and cost have no relationship to each other. I'm going to say that again. Value and cost have no relationship to each other, except every seller wants to tie them together. What do you think sellers say? when they take you or you go visit their property and they want to show you the pool in the backyard what's one of the first statements that comes oh, out of their mouth how that. much it costs them to build it oh i paid one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars for that my house is my property just went up good wow. for you actually mm -hmm. sir it might have declined in value because the thing is cost is in the past it's already sunk it's already happened when we're looking at market value are we looking in the past or are we looking to the future 
future. Look into the future. So the market value actually has nothing to do with the market cost. The market value is what we think someone will pay for that thing in the future. Mm -hmm. What we predict someone will pay for that thing. That's a really hard conversation sometimes to have, especially with sellers who've done a lot of work on their property. Oh, yeah. Because it's easy for them to do things like over improve where they do too much and they've spent more money than they're seeing back as a return. So Travis is what you're trying to say is not all improvements are worth equally worth um, their more value. Yeah, no, exactly. The, the, in some improvements, the cost of them exceeds the benefit. And that pool, probably the classic one, uh, classic one right there. Right. There's not a pool on this planet, folks, that I've ever seen in ground pool that adds as much value to the property as it what to, as it what <laughs> as it costs to put in. It's one of the few improvements you can make on a property that almost universally will always have the same result. You spent more than the value you added. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's something you would want to do as long as you know, like you're going to be there. Because there's so many other things that are so much cheaper that will add more value to the property than that. And that, and that, that is an important distinction that I try to remind my clients of. Sometimes your clients get so caught up in, well, should I do this? Is it worth it? Am I going to get that back when I sell it? And I always ask them the same thing. Are you planning on selling in the next couple of years? Well, no, not really. Then do it if that's what you want. If you're going to be here four, five, 10, 15, 20 years, why are you worried about what you think some buyer 15 years from now is going to say? Who cares? But now if you plan to sell it in the next year, is it an important consideration what you think a buyer is going to do? Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, I always have that conversation with my folks just to kind of bring them back to reality on this thing we are allowed and expected to give advice about value that does not mean we are an appraiser we should never say we're doing an appraisal of the property nobody should say they're doing an appraisal of the property unless they have what kind of license appraiser's, appraiser's, license. appraiser's license okay now other vocabulary that you're going to need to know and the, like I said, the vocabulary becomes so important in this unit. I can't stress enough how much you need to go back through this unit and make flashcards for yourself and really make peace with Very the vocabulary because this is such a vocabulary driven unit. Yes. And when, I know for a fact when we get, I probably shouldn't have mentioned this right now, but since I'm already speaking, they're going to ask you questions and they'll mix up the definitions of things and your brain gets all jumbled. So as long as you have this by memory, muscle memory, like or brain memory, you can absolutely read and answer and be like, Oh, that's not what that is. That's not that definition. No. Yep. Absolutely. It, because it is definitional. Very. So one of the definitions that we first come to when we start talking about people's value is something called the cost basis. Cost base. We know what cost is. What is cost? What somebody what? Pays for. What well, they paid for something. Okay. But with real estate, because we own it for such a long time, we don't look at the cost basis as simply what we paid for it. We look at the cost basis as what we have invested in it while we've owned it. Well, of course, that starts at what we paid for it. But what about all those things we've done to the property since then? What do y'all think? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Do they get included in the cost basis? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody does a hundred, if somebody does a hundred thousand dollar kitchen renovation, are we going to add that hundred thousand dollars to their cost basis? Yes. 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 Now that does not mean they're going to get that value back. That doesn't mean we're going to factor that into predicting the value. But when somebody wants to know what it, if I just simply say, I want to know what your cost basis in the property. What am I asking for? What they've invested in. Yeah. Every dollar they've ever done what? Spent. Put in that property. From purchase price through now, how much are you in this thing for? 
Mm-hmm. That's the cost basis. Cost basis. Make sure you know that terminology. Yes, it will come full circle. It will. Absolutely. Sure, now, Shirley has a question. Oh, go ahead, Shirley. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, um, but that excludes property taxes, correct? That's not money you've invested in the property. That's a good question. We're not talking about expenses related to the property. You know, you don't include your electric bill or your property taxes or what you paid to landscapers or anything like that. Those are just expenses. Those are ongoing expenses. Okay. That's different than investing in improving the property. That, that That's what we want to include in the cost basis. Understood. Okay. Now, value itself and pre remember, value is that prediction of what we think the property would sell for. There are some factors that affect the property's value, either positively or negatively. Value can, of course, be affected positively, but it can also be affected negatively. The two main factors that change the value of property are something called supply and demand. Supply is how much of something is available. Demand is how much of that thing people want. So in March of 2020, we had a little supply and demand issue happen. Oh, that's right. Oh, yes. <sighs> COVID. The great toilet paper shortage of our lifetime happened in March of 2020. You all remember what it was like to find toilet paper for about six weeks mm -hmm. in March and April of 2020? You're shitting it, yeah. I mean, it was really, really getting interesting out there. Like, I remember... It was basically non-existent. <laughs> it was pretty much non-existent. And I remember finding some at a store, and Leslie who works in our office was out and I texted her, I said, they've got toilet paper over at the Walgreens on Kilmaine. Do you want me to get you some? Cause I know you said you didn't have any. She said, get whatever they'll let you get. Of course it was like two packs or whatever. And so I said, I'm gonna get two packs. I'll keep one and I'll give her one. Folks, I drove a pack of toilet paper, an eight pack of toilet paper. That's all it was to Zebulon <laughs> to give it to her. We met in a parking lot of a food line and it looked like we were doing a drug deal for this <laughs> toilet paper. And that was all related to a change in these two factors, right? Both of these factors changed about toilet paper at that point in time. What changed about the supply of toilet paper at that point in time? Went down. There wasn't much of it. There wasn't much of it. Why? What happened? The demand. The demand. No, the demand didn't change the supply. What changed the supply? When people were buying the amount of The amount. The amount of toilet paper. So supply is the amount of toilet paper being produced by the toilet paper companies. What changed the supply, folks? A lot wasn't being produced. Why was it not being produced? Now you're getting there. Why was it not being produced? Nobody was working. Okay. The body was working. They had to shut the plants down, right? The plants had to shut down. Does that change the amount of supply available when they stop producing it? Yes. 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 What does that do to the value? The value goes Increases up. it. It's more valuable because there's less of it available, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. There's another factor there, though, and that's the one you all were paying attention to, and that's why I wanted to separate it out for you. The demand factor. Demand also changed in that period of time for toilet paper. What happened to demand for at-home toilet paper in that period of time? It, went up. it also increased. increased. Demand increased. Why? Were we pooping more during that period of time? Or was it simply everyone because everybody was, everyone, was home. everyone was at home? Everyone was home. Everybody was at home. And what we had never really thought about but quickly realized is that the toilet paper at the office and the toilet paper at the hotel and the toilet paper at your house don't come from the same plant. How many of you all never thought about that until the toilet paper ran out? <laughs> There was toilet paper on the planet, but it was all that single ply shit that they set, that they have in the bathroom at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> 
And none of it was marketed for individual sale because it was in big cases and meant to be sold to hotels and all those things. So you couldn't get it to the consumers. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. So the demand for it went up tremendously because more people were staying at home while the supply also dropped. What does the value of that thing do when that combination of factors happens? Oh, it's skyrocket. it's right. skyrockets, right? Either one of those by itself, supply going down, that would have made value go up. Demand going up, that would have made value going up. But when both are happening at the same time, the value goes crazy. Now apply that to the housing market that we've seen over the last couple of years. Has the supply of available housing changed? Yes. 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 And by available, I mean, not, I don't mean the number of houses on earth. I mean, the number of houses that are for sale at any given time. Has that changed? Yes. 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 People just aren't putting their house on the market. Mm -hmm. So we have very little inventory. What does that do to value? Increases. Oh, increases. Increases. increases it. Has demand changed over the last couple of years? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 People all of a sudden realize they might not want to be in places so close to each other. Maybe they want more space. Maybe they're going to work from home. They need more space inside. Maybe they're now working from home so they don't need to be so close to the city. They're going to move a little bit further away because they're going to work remotely. Their shopping habits change. Their demands change. Well, when demand increased for a lot of that housing, and supply decreased, what happened to the value of that housing? Went up. It went up dramatically, very quickly. So it's important to understand how supply and demand can impact value very, very quickly. When you're trying to predict value, because remember, value again has not happened yet. The most important, put a star, put an asterisk, this is absolute test time right here. This is a word I guarantee you're going to see on a test in several days. You might get three questions about this word. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that important? It really is. The most important economic factor when you're trying to predict value is something called the principle of substitution. What does it mean when you substitute something? Switch it out. You switch it out, right? So, like, if you go on Instacart and you want a certain type of grapes and they don't have them, what might they do? Extra for substitution. They substitute out something else, right? Mm -hmm. And they might even substitute it at the same price. Does that make sense? Yes. Functionally, don't those things have the same value now? If you, if you, if it turned out that you were willing to pay the same thing for the same for both of them, don't they functionally now have the same value? Yes. Right. Simply because you did what with one? It's substituted. You substituted it one for the other. Here's why that's so important to us in predicting value. That's how we predict value, folks. When we want to know the value of a certain property we look for a property to substitute it with now when instacart is substituting for you what do they look for similar price similar Properties. similar item similar item, item right when it, when when instacart is substituting for you they want they look for an item that's as similar as possible to the one you chose correct yes mm -hmm. how many of you have ever heard of we're looking for comps in a real estate conversation. I'm looking for comps. I'm on the hunt for comps. Yeah. yeah Comp is short for comparable. When I want to know the value of one home, one piece of property, what's the what should I search for to substitute it with? Like properties. Property of similar value. I know, well, I don't know similar value, Calvin, because I don't know the value yet. <laughs> How about a property of similar characteristics? Characteristics, okay. Right? How about a property of similar kit? Because I'm trying to predict the value. I can't really compare values because I don't know a value for this one. But if I find one that is similar in as many ways as possible, it's in a similar location, it's on a similar size lot, it's similar age, it's a similar number of square feet, similar number of bedrooms. If I can find something that is similar in all those ways, 
Y'all listen to me now because it's an important question. Could I not just substitute one for the other? Yes. Yes. In other words, if I find one that's that similar, could I not just assume that the current property I have right now would probably sell for exactly the same thing as the really similar one that I just substituted it for? Yep, absolutely. That's what we do in value, folks. It's like a real-life algebra problem. That's exactly what we do in value. We simply look for other properties because, it, and this is where you have to get out of your own way and think about what we're trying to do. We don't know what these properties are worth because they haven't what yet? The one that we're looking at, the one we're helping our client oh, with, oh, it oh. hasn't what? Sold. 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 It hasn't sold. They're looking to us and going, what's it worth? What are we going to use to substitute and help us come up with a value? The properties. A similar property that we can just swap it out with. Not physically swap it out. We're not going to pick the damn thing up off the foundation and move it lot to lot. What we're literally talking about is in our brains, if that house down the street that's very similar in the same neighborhood just sold for two fifty, what is ours likely to sell for? Two fifty. Okay. Thank, thank you for clarifying. What was that? That we're not swapping them physically. Oh, you thought we were, <laughs> you thought we were doing some heavy lifting, huh? I did. I did. Uh, I got gotcha. you. No, we're just that's what substitution is. And you're going to see that in a couple different ways. It is yeah. the basis for the most common way of appraising property, which is called the sales comparison approach. You need yeah. to know that phrase right there. The sales comparison method or approach of valuing property is completely based on what economic principle? Supply and demand. Not supply and demand. Substitution. 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 Comparison approach whenever you're doing your Instacart thing and they're trying to make comparisons, that's what they're doing. They're substituting by comparing. Is it like or is it the same price? Or Sales comparison approach. What kind of properties are we looking for? Comparable. Yeah. Comparable. We're looking for comparables, comps, correct? Correct. Yes. And the only reason we want comps is so we can do what with them? Compare. compare. But what's another word for compare? Substitute. Substitute. Substitute them for our subject property. Like a substitute mm -hmm. teacher. If I can find something very comparable and substitute it for my subject property, and I know that that property sold for 300000 what can I assume the reasonable value is of my property that I'm dealing with? $300,000. Name $300,000. That right there is the economic principle of substitution, folks. Right. And just because I'm a linear thinker, so we just talked about supply and demand. That was one thing that affected value. But the most commonly used, and I find that whenever Travis says things like one of the most commonly used in the state of North Carolina or in real estate, that most commonly, for some reason, for me, it doesn't hit home that that's an important statement. So when he says like, this is the most commonly used one, please be advised that he's gonna come back in 15, 20 minutes and be like, all right, so what's the most commonly used? Yep, you're right, because that's likely what they're gonna test you on, most commonly used in things, okay? So if you were, if you, another one. the principle of substitution, the basis for comparing properties, whenever you are comparing one property to another, what process are you using? The principle of what? Substitution. Substitution. Whenever you're choosing comps, you're using the principle of substitution. That is just the way you are coming up with that value. There are other ways to come up with value that are used less often. There are other ideas about value that are less important, but they could come up on the test. Again, this is vocabulary. Learn the vocabulary. The this second, is just another angle we're coming from. The second principle of value says that properties, land, homes, buildings, structures, all have the greatest possible value 
if they are in conformity with their surroundings. Okay. Properties that stick out like a sore thumb, even if they stick out because they're nice, like in Durham, do not have the greatest return on a value. There's nothing to compare it. Because there's nothing to compare it to. It's like, why did you build that nice ass place in the middle of this dump? Right? Or why did you build this dump in the middle of all these nice houses? <laughs> if you want to maximize the value of any property, what should that property and that structure be when you compare it to other things that are immediately surrounding it? Similar. Very similar. Very similar. Yeah. In conformity. It should mm -hmm. be in conformity. Are we all okay with that statement? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And so the more and more and more properties in an area come into conformity, the higher and higher and higher value goes for all of those properties mm -hmm. over time because that principle of conformity is so strong. And before we go forward, Travis, I know Jessica raised her hand and Stephen just did too. Yep. What's up, Jessica? My question is, um, is conformity cons uh, in consideration when the appraiser is doing the appraisal value or is it more of just like, based, do you know what, I hope I made my question clear. You did. So let me ask, I'm going to answer your question with a question as I'm prone to do sometimes. What is the appraiser there to do? To set a value. On the Not set a value right there. You're going to get in it. trouble on, on the test. What is the appraiser there to do? To give an estimate of there you go. value. Okay, but give an estimate or an opinion of what is value. What the property might what? Might sell for. What it might sell for. So you need to be able to, and I, I know you, you this morning you volunteered for, but I want to make sure you got that, right? right? The purpose of the appraiser is to give their opinion about what they think this property would sell for. Reasonably. Everybody okay with that statement? Because an appraiser could give that estimate of their opinion of value, but somebody could come and buy it for a hundred thousand more because that's what it's worth to them. That's right. We're not saying that's going to be what it actually sells for. We're saying that's what the appraiser predicts Reasonable. it will. That's what that's a guess. And it could be more, it could be less, but it's an educated guess. Okay. Jessica, here was your original question to me though. You wanted to know if the appraiser was going to take that into consideration when they come and look at the property. So here's what we just said. Conformity impacts value. The more in conformity you are, the more likely you are to see higher value. And the more out of conformity you are, the more likely you are to see lower value. Okay. What's the appraiser's job again? to find what the value or what it, the, the property could possibly sell for. Okay, so now combine those two. You just told me two things, that conformity affects value and the appraiser's job is to predict value. So now what's the answer to your question? Is the appraiser going to take conformity into consideration? Yes. They have to. Okay. You see why, you see why I wanted you to see that yourself, right? Mm -hmm. That, but the appraiser has to take anything into consideration that would predict that would act, have an impact on what somebody might what buy, buy for what they might pay for it. Is the appraiser going to take train tracks into consideration? Yep. Yeah. If it's near him. Yeah. You think that's going to be a positive consideration or a negative consideration when the appraiser is giving an opinion of value? Negative. 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 Everything that can impact the property's value has to be taken into consideration. Stephen? Uh, years ago, I bought a house in a very nice neighborhood, larger houses, trees, and uh, my house was the smallest one. It was perfect for us, but I got excited because it was the smallest house surrounded by all these others. In fact, right behind us was a house that was worth over a million, and we were in a smaller house. It was nice, but it wasn't, you know, it didn't conform. And when we put this house on sale, in the morning, we had offers by the afternoon, which I wasn't ready for that, but that's how fast it went. So and my guess is that the people who bought it probably didn't keep it the way it was. They probably brought it more into what? 
Absolutely, a conformity. Yes, they did. They the first it. first thing to do is add on to it, finish That's more space, did. add more space because it's it's more valuable when you bring it into what conformity. Conformity. Does that make sense for everybody? Yep. Okay. So that's that's an important idea. Now, an equally important idea is when we look at real estate, because real estate is really land plus stuff that's attached to land. Sometimes it becomes necessary for us to kind of take like a, a, a little bit of a building block approach to make these comparisons because we're not going to always find properties that are exactly comparable to each other. I mean, it's kind of hard to find properties. Like example, my neighborhood, everything's built in the late seventies. When you get houses that are, you know, coming up on 45 years old, 50 years old, you're going to get a real hodgepodge of some that have been completely updated. Some that have never been touched. And the vast majority of them are going to be at some stage in the middle there, right? So, I mean, you go in houses in my neighborhood, folks, let me tell you what you're going to find in most houses. You're going to have one bathroom that's original from 1979. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a kitchen from 1998. You're going to have paint from last week. Mm -hmm. You're going to have LVT flooring from last week. You're going to have another bathroom that was done in 2005. Literally, the whole damn house is of a different age. None of it is congruent because they've done different parts at different. How many of y'all feel like that's what happens with homes as they age, right? Yes. You know, very few people. The only reason we renovated our whole house at one time is because we're on a damn TV show. Otherwise, who does that? Who goes through and just guts the whole thing? Very few people. It is done in stages, which makes them very hard to compare. How do you compare this house? They might have been super comparable when they were built, right? And they might still be super comparable in the sense of square footage, location, lot size, which are all super important. But as far as the interior, it's hard to compare the house that's over here with the new kitchen and the old bathrooms to this one down here. It's got the new bathrooms, but the old kitchen. So to make those kinds of comparisons, what we have to be able to do is kind of separate out individual pieces of the property and say, you know what? I think this one thing is having this much of an impact on the value. As an example, we do it all the time mentally without the, the, this is the interesting thing about valuation to me. We act like it's foreign to us, except we do this all the time. Like is it's almost like pre-programmed into us. We just don't think about doing it. When somebody renovates their kitchen, if you've watched one of those renovation shows, what's the first thing they talk about? How much is going to what? How much is going to be worth? Or how much is going to cost them? And then what's the second thing they talk about? How much is going to be worth? How, how much? Is, how much it changes the value of the house, right? Yeah. Right. That second number, folks, is the principle of contribution. The first number is the cost. The second number is the principle of contribution. When you watch Flip or Flop or Magnolia or any of those television shows, they always look at how much we're spending versus how much we're going to what? Sell it. How much we're going to get out of that particular renovation. And they don't look at the overall value as much as they say, well, if we were going to replace this bathroom, that bathroom would probably cost 15000 but that bathroom would add what? Value. $20,000, $25,000 worth of value to the house. Isn't that how they talk about it? Mm -hmm. And so what they're doing is looking at how much value that one improvement contributes overall to the value of the property. We know we're never going to sell the bathroom separately, but what we're trying to do is break it down into individual components and say, we think this is the value that that thing is adding to the property. Let me tell you why that's important. Come in my neighborhood. Lots of houses with a garage, lots of houses without a garage. Now, nobody's buying just a garage in my neighborhood. You don't need to know what a garage is worth. 
to buy a garage. There are no garages for sale here. Hmm. But but do you need to have some idea of what a buyer would be willing to pay for a garage so that you can compare homes that do have one versus homes that what? That don't. 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 Is that an important thing to know? Yes. 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 And that, folks, is the principle of contribution. The principle of contribution is all about, okay, if I look at this thing as a separate, as if it was separate, how much value would it contribute to the property if it did have that garage? What would be the additional value to the property if it did have the garage? What would be the additional value to the property if it did have a pool? So if we've done the comparison and we believe the pool adds $20,000 in value to the property, then what's the pool's contribution to the property? $20,000? $20,000. That's exactly what it is. Could things have a negative contribution to the value of the property as well? Yeah. Yes. Sometimes pools. Yes. Sometimes pools. Tell you something that had a negative contribution to value. I've seen it all when it comes to houses. Maybe but, a shed. But the, yeah, but I, the, maybe. No. I, the one that stands out to me in all my time in this business, I walked into a home one time and it was interesting that there were never pictures of the bathrooms. It was a nice house, uh -oh. North Raleigh, but there weren't pictures of the bathrooms. And I thought that was odd. I found out why when I got there. <laughs> the homeowners had had the bathrooms renovated. And as part of the renovation, they had had custom colored fixtures installed in the bathrooms. One of the bathrooms had entirely black fixtures. One of the bathrooms had entirely burgundy fixtures. One of the bathrooms had entirely hunter green fixtures. And we are talking tub, toilet, vanity top, green. Now, I am quite sure that was not cheap. They don't sell that at Lowe's. You got to custom order that. Yeah, there's a reason they don't sell that in Lowe's. Did it? There's a reason they don't sell it in Lowe's. Exactly. <laughs> What do you think the contri contribution of value was for those custom fixtures? Probably right. a negative. It's a negative number. Uh -uh. A it's good. a negative number. Not only did it not contribute any value, they actually take value away. Because what do you All think away. most any buyer who's viewing that property is saying to themselves? We're going to fix this. As soon as we buy this, we got to rip out all three bathrooms and start mm -hmm. over. Unless they're colorblind. <laughs> I mean, I remember my buyer going, what in the f is that? And that was just after they saw the first one. We saw the other two. By the time they got to the third one, they were literally laughing out loud. I think I could go with the black colored ones, but the other ones? Well, yeah, maybe the black. But I'm going to tell you, that even the like black this. one, even the black one, they had bright yellow brass uh, hardware. Hmm. So it was black with brass um, uh, faucets and shower enclosure doors. And I'm like, look, what are we like? Because Queen of the Nile here? I mean, come on. I mean, this is not the Luxor in Las Vegas. That's a no for me. Um, and, and for most people, that's, that's a no. Uh, so, you know, but and that's fine if that's somebody's taste. But what is the contribution of value there? Because that's really what we care about. How much value is being contributed there? None. N not only none, but negative, right? Negative, yeah. Negative value. Absolutely. Okay, good. Good. Make sure you're good on that principle of contribution. You see why this is so vo vocabulary heavy here? Like why you're going to, th that's what this whole unit is. Very vocabulary heavy. And you really do have So to Chris asked a good question, um, but I think some of these ideas might be blending. So it says, are we able to have sellers itemize their contributions with receipts to help sway an appraisal or do appraisers see, just take an area? Well, see, I love that question. Only cause I get to yell at you now. Are we able to have sell sellers itemize contributions with receipts? Y'all help me out here. What the hell does a receipt have to do with a contribution? 
what do receipts what do receipts show folks Cost. Cost. What do we not care about at all when we're trying to predict okay. value? Okay. Cost. Okay. So receipts point, don't help. Travis pointed it out for me. I didn't even think about that. Right. Receipts don't help with anything when it comes to value. What are we trying to predict when we're trying to predict contribution? What a buyer would pay either above and beyond sort of a baseline. In other words, if this house had normal bathrooms, would the buyer pay more for it or would they pay less for it? If they would pay less for it, then this has a positive contribution. If they would pay more for it without these bathrooms, then this has a negative contribution. Which one do you think it would be on something like that? You think it would be a, you think it would be a negative contribution or a positive contribution on those bathrooms? A negative contribution. Negative. Negative. Absolutely. Absolutely. Does that make sense for everybody now? Okay. So really, when you look at it, receipts simply don't matter when you're talking about contribution because receipts represent cost and not contribution of value. And that's why it's so imperative to kind of get out of your own way when it comes to value. One of the other really interesting ideas of value is that value in some ways is very fake. Not only are we predicting what people will pay for the property, we have to predict what people will predict about the property. In other <laughs> words, in other words, buyers are building something into their offers when they make an offer on a property. They're building in an anticipation of what's going to happen in the future. In other words, people said to me, Man, I can't wait to see what property values are going to do over there in Cary when Apple comes. You know what I said? Nothing. I do. Oh. Nothing. <laughs> well, I mean, you do know. Nothing's going to happen. They're like, yeah, it will. Like, no, it won't. Y'all know why? Because it already happened, just the idea of it? It already happened just based on the idea that they were coming. Yeah. When did the value change of those properties in the eyes of buyers who ultimately are the ones that decide value anyway? When it was announced. The day Apple announced they were coming. Yeah. How many of you think people started factoring that into their offers the very next day that Apple's going to be here? Apple's going to be here. What do y'all think? Yeah. Yes. Yep. You hear about it. It's already built in. It's already there. That's the principle of anticipation. When people hear that things are coming, they're already factoring that in. It's already there. Think about like roads being constructed. 540. They've been working on 540 since I was in high school. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It might be done by the time I die. <laughs> Maybe. But we've been telling everybody about it in real estate transactions for 25 years. <laughs> and guess what? It's been impacting the value of those properties that are in its path for at least what? 25 years. 25 years. There's nothing wrong with those properties right now. As a matter of fact, some of the most beautiful property in Wake County that you can find at some of the best prices is in the path of 540. And it's nothing wrong with it. Right. How? Then why is the value so low? Why can you get that property for $200,000 less than you can get one a mile away? Because you're buying it anticipating what? A new road. Is the road. road's coming. Next door, next door neighbor. And so even though it hasn't happened, the, the change in value has already arrived. Does that make sense for everybody as far as the principle of anticipation goes? Totally. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's sort of like it's already baked in. Now, in real estate, particular to real estate, the idea of highest and best use is probably um, second only to the principle of substitution. Principle of substitution is always going to be the most important in determining value because ultimately, if you can find a similar property that recently sold, that's the best indication of value you're going to get. Think about it something other than real estate. If you wanted to sell your 2020 Honda Accord, 
What's going to be the best indication of the price you could get for yours? Another one? What other ones are selling for? What other ones have sold for recently, correct? Correct. And the more similar they are, the more the features line up, the better indication you have of what yours would sell for. Is that not correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. All we're doing is substituting. So it's always going to be the best way to determine value. The second best way to determine value from a real estate perspective is to look at something called highest and best use. Land can be used for lots of things. Remember, when we buy and sell real estate, what we're buying and selling is not the structure. We're buying and selling what? Land. The land. land. We're buying and selling the land. And when we're buying and selling the land, we want to make sure we understand that land can be used for a lot of different uses. Its current use may not be its best use. Sometimes the current owners, for whatever reason, aren't using the land for what would maybe be its best possible use if you're just trying to maximize value. You might see this with a little house that is on a huge lot in downtown Raleigh. Yes. Those exist. But that's not the highest and best use of that property. And in fact, we see that changing every day. What's happening to those lots on those huge, those little small houses that were built in the 1920s and 1930s and they're 1,200 square feet, but they're on an acre of land on Oberlin Road in Raleigh. They're What's getting, happening to that? Getting demolished. Well, demolished. It's mm -hmm. being demolished. And then what's happening? Putting in town Putting in townhomes or condos or four McMansions on that one lot, right? Yes. Because the highest and best use of that land is not as a single family home on one acre of land anymore. It was probably when it was constructed, but not anymore. And so when we value land, we don't just look at what it's currently being used for. What do we try to what do we try to predict? What it would be worth if it was being used for its highest and what? Best. Best, use. best use if we got the best out of this property what would it be worth then right everybody okay with that like a corner lot in uh carry probably be better used not as a house but maybe a gas station or that's a exactly right there may be a house on there right now but that doesn't necessarily mean that is the best use of the property. It just means there happens to be a house there now, but now you'd be better off tearing it down and putting the sheets there. And maybe in 50 years, the best use would be residential again. That's, it could change again or farmland. You know? Yeah, yeah. It, it absolutely could change again. We as real estate brokers are expected to give our opinion of value to our clients. That is an expected piece of advice for us to give opinion of value to our clients. We do not call that an appraisal. We don't ever call that an appraisal. We do not give clients appraisals when we are valuing the property. That's not our job because we're not who? We're not appraisers. We're simply not appraisers. What we give them is a CMA. A CMA is done for our who? Client. Clients. That's part of old car. So if you get a test question that says, should we give all of our clients an opinion of value, what do you think? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We owe it to them as part of old car to give them a CMA, an opinion of our value of the property. This is the phrase we're supposed to use when we give our client our opinion of value. Some version of that. We think this is the probable sales price of the property. We think this is what the property would probably sell for. If it sold today, we think this is the number it would bring. That's the way we look at value as a real estate broker uh, in North Carolina. Uh, uh, I like it. Um, so would you say uh, this is the value of your property? Well, I would not use that statement. I might feel that this is the value of their property, but how would I say that to stay in compliance with the rule, folks? What do you think? 
This is my opinion of what? What do I have to say? My what opinion. phrase do I have to use? Of what it would probably sell for, of the probable sales price. Do I say this is my opinion of the value of your property? No. No. You can't. no. no. Right? Amy says, so this is what my agent did when she told me she was going to check comps in the area and get back to me. Exactly, Amy. That's what they were doing. They didn't really eloquently say it, but what is the process of checking comps and then getting back to you with an opinion? You're doing a what? CMA. CMA. Doing a CMA. That's what a CMA is. Mm -hmm. It stands for comparative market analysis. Again, what are we looking for? Compa comps. Comparable properties. And what process, what principle are we using whenever we're looking for comparable pro properties? Substitution. Substitution. Exactly right. A CMA is the principle of substitution. Everybody okay on that? So I could see probably a touch question, Travis, saying what principle is the CMA? I agree completely. A CMA is using the process of substitution to try to come up with a prediction of a sales price for a property. Should we call it an appraisal? No. No, because no, we're not an appraiser. We might have the same opinion as an appraiser. Maybe we do, maybe we don't, but it's still not an appraisal because we're not an appraiser. We are actually also allowed, if we want to, to give an opinion of value to a customer. Yep. But we cannot call it a CMA. Here's the way I think of that. What's the letter C in CMA could also be thought to stand for what? Customer. Client. Client. That's a client thing. We only give CMAs to who? Client. Client. Clients. We can give an opinion of what we think the property will sell for to somebody who's not our client, AKA a customer. We cannot call it a CMA, though. The Real Estate Commission does not call it a CMA. What does the Real Estate Commission call it when we are doing an opinion of value for somebody who's not our client, for somebody who is simply a customer? Broker price opinion. It is called a broker price opinion. And here is the reason we have to have a different name for it. I want you to look at this statement right here. Who is licensed to give broker price opinions to customers in North Carolina? Non-provisional brokers. Non-provisional brokers. It is the one of the few things that a provisional broker is not allowed to do in North Carolina. Provisional brokers can do almost anything a non-provisional can do as long as they do it under supervision. But provisional brokers are not allowed to give a BPO. I got a question for you. Mm -hmm. Can a provisional broker tell their client what they think the property will sell for? Yes. 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 Uh, because if they're telling their client, they're doing a what? They're doing a CMA. Which is they're doing a CMA, and CMAs can be done by provisional brokers. They have to be done. In they're fact, doing. they have to be done. You're supposed to do it for your clients. But a provisional broker is not allowed to give an opinion of value to who? A customer. 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 So here's the truth of the matter, folks. If you're a provisional broker and you're talking to a potential seller trying to get their listing, and they say, well, what do you think I should sell it for? What does your answer have to be to stay in compliance with this rule? I can't tell you. You have to hire me. You you might tell you that. I can't give you that advice until you hire me. Mm -hmm. Is a non-provisional broker allowed to give that? Yes. Yes, yes. but yes. provisional can't do it. I don't really know why. why. I don't know why. I, right. I don't know. I really have worked hard to try to figure out what the justification for this is. I've never really been able to come up with it other than just to say it's the rule. It's the rule. It's the rule. It's the rule. I don't know. I don't know why they made that the rule. But provisional broker can't do a BPO. They can do a CMA, but not a BPO. That's it for unit 7.1. Woo! Woo!
<laughs> we told you it was going to be vocabulary all the way, right? Vocabulary heavy. And it is. <laughs>